Almost every community has at least one store or restaurant that it's known for, and Columbus is certainly no exception. So Javier, if I name a part of Columbus, let's see what comes to mind for you. Okay. So Northside. Clown Cone. South Columbus. Thurman's. West Columbus. Tommy's Diner. Ooh, Easy. good, <laughs> good. Okay, now your turn. What comes to mind from the east side? It's an Italian restaurant, T-A-T, which has been around, seems like forever. Since 1929, actually. Can you believe it? We sent WOSU producer George LaVert over there to get more of their story. We are here at the iconic TAT restaurant on Columbus' east side. And I'm here with Jeff Kirkbright, Michelle Carova, Marianne Kirkbright. First of all, tell me a little bit about the history of, of the restaurant. Well, my grandfather started it back in 1929 um, over on Goodale Street in Flytown. With the expansion of the highway, um, I think it was in the 30s or 40s, he moved to Hampton and Main Street. And that was really, that's the beginning of our restaurant. And then my parents started it back in 1955. They opened up their first one on Broad and James. And then their second one was on Beachwood and Livingston in 1962. And then in 1980, we came here and they closed the other two restaurants eventually. And we just have this one standing with a party room and a dining room. And that was enough for us. So I see you got pictures up here. You've got pictures of, of, of Papa, Papa, Pete. Papa, Papa Pete. Pete. Tell me about Papa Pete. Well, I, I'm gonna go with a, a, a legendary story that his son had told us, um, Jimmy, had told us about, about his father. Um, and it was many years ago, but, but uh, they would have cards. They would play cards. There would be a group of five to 10 folks and they'd play for three or four days at a time. And uh, during this time, you know, Pete would throw on a apron and he would make, you know, sandwiches. He would he would whip up spaghetti and and uh, you know the the in the old fashioned way. And um, and all the folks that were playing cards say, Hey, Pete, you know, you should you should think about opening a restaurant, you know, someday because it's you know your food's really good. You should think about doing it. So the story goes is that that that's how this originated. Where, where the restaurant came from was from card playing days uh, from, from many years ago. Tell me what TAT stands for. Well, what he always told us when we were growing up, one of the stories was when his father, our Grandpa Pete, had his restaurant on Goodale. He said that the flight pattern would go, the, the old TWA, that's what we were named after, Transatlantic Transportation, would fly over his restaurant to the airport okay. and he looked up and he said he saw that plane all the time and that's what he decided to name it. <laughs> Dad had was a big part of this whole thing. Your father was a big part of it. Talk to me a little bit about him. He never wanted to be in the restaurant business. He wanted to be in the funeral business. That's one and, thing I'll tell you about him. And a fireman. Him. He wanted to be a yep. fireman also. Mm -hmm. But his dad wanted him to be in the restaurant business and he actually got a scholarship, a full ride to Notre Dame to play football. And he was there for a very small amount of time and then his dad got sick. So he came back home to help his dad with the restaurant and he's been in the restaurant business ever since. Um, and he was just a hard working, and when we were little we never got to see him because he was always over here. He was just such a hard working guy, 24, 24 seven. And he loved it though, it's not like he had to, he just loved being here. Well, he ruled what he said went. Yeah. He, and he, he liked it a specific way, and it was his way or no way, and that's kind of how. <laughs> that's true. Yeah, that's and true. that's kind of what we miss, you know, not having him, you know, looking over everybody right now. But we try to keep it the same way as when he was here. And we've said all along, you know, if it's not broke, don't try to fix it. From food to the way we treat the customer to you know, that we care about this business and, and, and so the customer does realize we appreciate them being here. You know, that's who he was and that's who he is and that's what this is. This restaurant is Jimmy Croba. 
everyday people come in, they've been coming in for 20, 30, 40, 50 years, and, and uh, that's when you know you, you're a part of a good thing and the right thing. So your dad did things in the community uh, that kind of helped people. He was a great supporter of the community. He supported the schools, the churches, um, the homeless. He would hire people from halfway houses and give them a second chance. Jeff was talking to somebody that had recently came in here, an older gentleman, and he said if it wasn't for my dad, he wouldn't be where he was today because my dad hired him um, right out after he got out of prison. The things that we had never heard is almost, it's constant in our, in our lives today. People will tell us, you know, things that he had done for them or for their families or for the church. And he, it, it wasn't about the recognition for him. The restaurant itself and the, the way that it's maintained and stayed the way that it was years ago. Do you think that's what keeps your customers coming back in addition to the good food that they can get when they come here? Oh yeah, I think it is. We're old school. I mean, as you can see, nothing has really changed in this place and I think people like that. It's a step back in time when they come in here. But what, what, what signature dishes? I know you do pizzas, but you're not known just for pizzas. So talk to me about what's on the menu. Well, this is our cook right here. She preps everything. Um, I would say the special lasagna is, we're known for that. Um, she makes our uh, lasagna noodles. It's a homemade yellow egg noodle. Our homemade spaghetti is also homemade. Um, and that's, we're very well known for that. And our poor boy sandwich, mm -hmm. which is Italian sub. If Italian's not your thing, and this is an Italian-American restaurant, if you can't find something on this menu from a steak to fried chicken, you know, to the pizza, you know, to seafood, we, we, it's a pretty diverse menu. It's a large menu. We've got a, a great restaurant here. We've got great history with the restaurant. Where do we go from here? Oh, we're shooting for 100 years. Okay. We're at 93, shooting for 100 years. Yeah, and we're hoping to get, um, some of our products out into the stores. So that's one thing that we're working on. Hopefully we can do it, but it's been a challenge. I appreciate you taking the time talking to me about TAT restaurant and the real meaning of what TAT stands mm -hmm. for. And I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Well, thank thanks for having thank us. Thank you yes, very much. Thank you. Ooh, that made me hungry, Charlene. Yeah, me too. And if you aren't hungry yet, producer George Lavert is heading out to another food establishment in Bucyrus, Ohio. Man, I would love to have his job. What type of food are we talking now? This time, it's a place that specializes in bratwurst. Bratwurst, made here in Ohio? I have to see this. Roll that beautiful bratwurst footage. <laughs> Hi, Carla. Hey, George. So nice to meet you. Nice meeting you as well. Carla, I'm super excited about Quads. Oh, good. Tell me what's happening. I'm ready to go. Ready to go? Yes. Okay. Well, first, though, you're going to have to put this on. Okay. And a hairnet. Wow. And then we'll go back in the processing area. Okay, I'm all set now. All right. Look like a natural. Come on in, George. Okay. Thank okay. you. This is our bratwurst making room. What uh, Carolyn and Evan are doing now is they've, they've ground the pork, they've mixed it in the mixer. Uh, Carolyn just loaded up the uh, hydraulic stuffer. She's going to twist off the bratwurst as they come off the horn. The casings are a natural product, so they vary in diameter. They okay. can get you know skinnier and larger. Sure. So she has to um, either shorten or lengthen the link to make the weight exact. And we go for four links to a pound, and it is by experience. It is a craft. That's pretty deep. Tell me about the history of your business. Well, the history of Carly's goes back to 1929. It was a neighborhood grocery. We had um, a one-room store where the clerk would grab a, a can of beans off the shelf for you behind the shelf and give it to you on the other side of the counter. When they first were making bratwurst, they would make 20 pounds for a week's time, and they would have to eat what was left over. <laughs> can you imagine? Now we can make 2,000 pounds in one day. 
why is Bucyrus known for bratwurst? Bucyrus is more of a German community originally, a lot of German settlers and sausages just naturally came along for the ride. That's why every neighborhood grocery had a bratwurst recipe. What makes a Bucyrus bratwurst different? Bratwurst itself means like a frying sausage. We have a wonderful product here in Bucyrus because we add a, a cracker meal and egg to it along with mustard seeds and the caraway seeds in and no fennel because that would be more of an Italian sausage. With the USDA we have certain standards of identity and the curious thing is a Bucyrus bratwurst might not be an actual bratwurst by the USDA standard. If you go to Germany, you'll find different kinds of bratwurst. So the spices, they all differ no matter where you're at. Tell me a little bit about the history of the first bratwurst festival. There were eight little neighborhood groceries that made bratwurst on their own with their own recipes. Well, back in the 60s, there was a, a sidewalk sale uptown called the Colonel Crawford Days. And other towns in Ohio were starting their own festivals. So Bucyrus looked around and said, what do we have that makes us unique? And bratwurst was, of course, the first choice. The Bucyrus Bratwurst Festival was born in 1968. It was the first year for that. I'd love to try one. Sounds good. Let's go. Let's, OK, thanks. We got some pictures here. Mm -hmm. That is my grandfather, Harry Carley, and his wife, Elta, and the three kids, Louie, Dorothy, and Ruthie. Harry's the one that started the business in 1929. That's the original store. When I okay. said neighborhood grocery, I wasn't kidding, a one room storehouse. So this gives you a little glimpse of inside the one room. Uh, that's my uncle there with a, a neighbor that was helping out. And you can see there behind a counter and how you were waited on back in those days. 1936. Mm -hmm. Who's this? My mom is Ruthie on the bottom and Dorothy, her sister. Those were the two that <laughs> continued the store during okay. the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. Yeah, I think that was probably around 1930. They lived right next to the store. And we were the end of town then. It was the edge of town, Bucyrus, which now goes on another couple miles. And there's mom with a cat in front of the store. <laughs> Now the store, of course, you know, started right before the Depression. Sure. My grandfather, Carly, what they did during the Depression was you, you sold to everybody on credit. Okay. Uh, it was hardly any cash back then. Yeah, this is one of the, the little sales tickets that we had back then, where you'd write down what a customer would get and then roll it up in a roll with their other previous charges. Okay. Mom always told me that um, Grandfather Harry would get ulcers and from worrying so much about how he was going to pay his bills okay. because he was always extending it's credit good. to others. Yeah, sure. And we had real nice wholesalers back then. And the salesman said, don't worry about it. Everybody's in the same boat. You don't, <laughs> don't worry about paying your bills. I know you're good for it. When you can, you will. And that was the 30s back in a small town. Different times. Different times, yeah. exactly. During World War II, Aunt Dorothy took over the store, and my mom, who was uh, a pilot at the time, um, helped run the Bucyrus Airport through the 40s and 50s. Late 50s, my grandfather, Harry, needed to retire. He was having some health issues, and, and he asked mom to come back in the store. The picture you have is back in 1964, Ruthie and Dorothy decided to invest in the business, and they were growing it, and they remodeled the whole store, and it's okay. now no longer that one-room yeah, store any longer. Sure. So it was quite a commitment. I came here just to get all that other background, but I yeah. really did want a bratwurst. Yeah. Oh, thanks, Thank Katie. Thank you. Yeah. What goes into this? You need to have a rye bun, mm -hmm. only rye. Okay. And then we prefer a little sauerkraut. Mm -hmm. uh, we have ours heated mm -hmm. and maybe a little onion. The mustard we use is horseradish mustard. Okay. Uh, beer and brat is what it's called. Okay. But you know, that, that would make a really, really good sandwich. Sounds good. All righty. I'm going to taste it a little bit here. Please do. I'll let you know. Got a kick? That's good. The sauerkraut really makes that. Yeah, doesn't it? It, it goes does. well with it. The mustard is good. That's the only way we do it. And you will not find ketchup anywhere. Mm. So please do not ask for ketchup. I don't think it would be fair to put ketchup on there. Carly, that's really good. That's a really good bratwurst sandwich. Thank you for having us. Oh, you're welcome. We've had a lot of fun. <laughs> so we thanks for coming. Thank we appreciate you. it.
no matter how much I try to stay healthy, if you put something fried in front of me like French fries, I cannot resist. You are not alone, Charlene. For me, it's fried zucchini. I love it. <laughs> but how about a fried bologna sandwich? I could go for that. Sounds good, huh? I have a place for you to go, too. Less than an hour from Columbus is GNR Tavern in Waldo, Ohio, which is known for its fried bologna sandwiches. Producer George Lavert is back on the scene for another food adventure. I gotta ask the question first. Is it bologna or bologna? Bologna. How much goes out per day? We average 1,000 to 1,200 pounds a week. What makes it so good? Cheese, pickle, and onion. In that order. In that order. When did this all start? George and Roy started in June of, June of 62. George Jacob and, and Roy Klingle. My wife and I and another couple bought it in uh, November 1st of 85. George and Roy actually had wings at the beginning. And then all of a sudden, George uh, came up with this uh, bologna recipe, and he went with the uh, bologna. Ohio is a, is a bologna capital, I guess, and, and it, it took off after that. Where do you get your bologna? It's a big meat packing firm in Columbus. Man, I can tell you, it's Falters. You can't buy it anywhere else but here. So if I want this fried bologna, then I need to come here. Correct. The wall over get it, okay. Nobody can use GNR. Looks good, smells good. I like to try it. Can we taste test it? Let's go. All right. Whoa. Oh this my goodness. Here we go. This is it. This is what I've been waiting for. Thank you. So, Brian, this is, this is the famed bologna sandwich. This is it. I noticed back there you have coconut cream pie, banana cream pie. Who makes those? My daughter makes those. Your daughter makes those. Yeah, she, she, she comes in at 5 o'clock in the morning to, to, to prepare those. So this is kind of a family run. Oh there. yeah, yeah. Is, that's the way you kind of set it up in the yeah. Why'd you do that? Well, Waldo's a village of 300, 350 max, and uh, I always wanted to make this a family restaurant. I, I, I wanted to see women, kids, so my wife and I, my daughter, and uh, I've got my son-in-law is a night manager, and I've got grandkids working in here, so it's, it's family, family, family. We all work to make Waldo a better place to live. So everybody comes here and gets this fried bologna sandwich with the pickles, sweet pickles, and the cheese. Cheese, and onion. pickle, and onion. And I'm gonna try it right now. Let's do okay, it. Okay, let's see what it tastes like. Be my first time. Thumbs up on that, that's good. It's great. One of the things I'm tasting is the sweet pickle against the fried bologna, the garlic fried bologna. The garlic, yeah. Yeah, is that, is that, is that by design? Yes. And you do taste the cheese on there, so they all work together. And I'm sounding like I'm a food critic, but it's very, very good. It tastes very, very good. And I think it takes sweet pickles versus the any dill pickles. Where do these sweet pickles come from? Because they don't taste just like out of a jar. Well, uh, but this is the only place you can get them. Uh, they're, they're called Secklers. Now, that's the brand name. And they make, they make the sandwich. They really do make the sandwich. It all works together for a great sandwich. Can you imagine yourself doing anything else? No. Anything different? No, no. My wife, my wife loves this. She loves greeting people, meeting people, and taking care of people. And this is, this is, this is her dream. And if it's her dream, it's my dream. Okay. And it's our kids' dreams. Okay. This is it. Thank you very much. Thank you. So far, we've ventured to places that make spaghetti, bratwurst, fried bologna sandwiches. I mean, could anything top that? Well, how about a place that specializes in cheese and chocolate? Whoo, Charlene, now you're speaking my language. <laughs> and if you aren't hungry yet, you will be. This time, George heads to Grandpa's Cheese Barn in Ashland, Ohio. We're at Grandpa's Cheese Barn, and I'm excited about this. I'm interested in some history about how this all got started, how it evolved, and how it came to where it is now. Grandpa Yarman, he was, um, he was a strong man. 
He was tall and he liked his cigars. And uh, when he first started in business, he traded a radio for a wheel of Swiss cheese. And the wheels of Swiss cheese averaged from 159 up to 200 pounds. He started uh, in the cheese business, I think about in 1945. He built a, a, a store in Lodi, Ohio. It was called Max Food Liner. Then he moved the store to West Salem in 1948 or 49. If the customer got snotty with the clerk or whoever it was, he would yell at him. <laughs> <laughs> he would tell over the loudspeaker, just leave if you don't want to be here. <laughs> so okay. he, he didn't take anything from, <laughs> okay. from people. So that was a good story. Okay. <laughs> But he was a nice man. He passed away in 1949, and the family thought that my wife and I would be, could take over the business for him. We built up the store in West Salem and got to be really a nice store, and I sold it in 1991, and we opened this store in 1978. It's been a real blessing, and we've done so well. We're so proud of it. Tell me some fond memories you have of growing up and coming in. Of growing up yes, in the store? Yes. They opened it when I was three. Our house um, is actually right next door that we grew up in. And one of my fondest memories is um, it was a real working barn when they bought it. So there were still animals in the store. So I remember a lot of times upstairs we would have cheese and meat. And you'd come around to the bottom of the store and there were sheep. So I remember having the animals and taking care of them. And when we first opened, we had just a coal uh, wood stove in the corner up at the top. <laughs> and it was cold. <laughs> it was really cold. Yeah. And uh, we opened in November. Yeah. And uh, we wore gloves uh, when people weren't in here. Yeah. When they come in, we took them off. <laughs> and the cheese would kind of freeze on the counter, which wouldn't hurt it, you know. Right. Like I remember a lot, like especially during Christmas, you know, it was a big family effort because we would eat dinner. My mom would say, all right, as soon as you guys are done, come over to the store. We have all these baskets to make for Christmas. You know, we would be so busy as we kept growing that, you know, my brothers and I would say, well, we'll put up the Christmas tree real quick and we'll be back over. <laughs> so. One asked about your cheese. This is Grandpa's Cheese Barn. What kind of cheeses do you have? Just give me an example of all the cheeses you might have. Well, we started out with mainly just about 10 different kinds, uh, and then we've grown to over 100 kinds. It's mostly local cheese. We buy from the Amish, too. Tell them about the Swiss cheese and how it was made and how you started off with that. Yeah, it takes a 12 pound of milk to make a pound of Swiss cheese. Okay. And uh, went to a local distributor. He had a small cheese house and he made, oh, I don't know, five or six wheels a day and I was allowed to go in and pick out the cheese I wanted. So I like to pick out the Saturday night cheese because it had more cream in it and uh, because they didn't have any way to get it rid of the cream on Saturday night. They used to put it in the forms in the wood box. They were round and they were 200 pounds. They weighed 200 pounds. That was the biggest seller. And it that's was still so our good. Okay. How's the business today? It's been wonderful. Really evolved? It's really evolved. We started with just the cheese barn and just the upstairs location. And then we opened up the bottom part, got rid of the animals like I had talked about, and opened up the cafe. And then in 95, mom and dad opened the candy store. Mom's, she really enjoys making candy, and they came up with uh, Sweetie's Jumbo Chocolates. And my wife always rolled the Buckeyes yeah, over Grandma, the Sweeties. Hey, always did the Buckeyes. Grandma always does okay. the Buckeyes. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Tell me about the importance of family. This is a family run. Right, it's a show. family business. Yes, sir. Yeah. Talk to me about right. that. We've really grown since, haven't yeah. we? Yeah. I think the significance with the family is that, you know, right now, not only does, you know, there's grandma and grandpa, my mom and dad, myself, my aunt. You know, we're all here together, and in, and in the end, you always have family. And the grandchildren are helping now, aren't yeah. they? And so that's okay. really nice. Yeah. Uh, For you, uh, that would be great, great grandchildren. Yeah, great, great. Yes. The original grandpa, now your grandpa. Right. How's that hit you? Oh, it feels so good. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. I uh, 
keep telling my uh, son-in-law, you've got to be grandpa now. Yeah. You've got to take it over uh, and <laughs> take my place. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> I want him to do that. And he's definitely grandpa, but he's yeah. great grandpa too great grandpa. Okay. to us. Okay. And then my dad is the son-in-law he was talking about who needs to soon become grandpa too. Right. <laughs> okay. It has been a pleasure. It's, oh, thank you, you. You both are delightful. So much fun. Which this is, yes, yes. <laughs> it's really been a pleasure. I thank you for your time. Thanks for it's, having it's us. Been really, it's uh, been really we, good. We yeah. thank you for coming You're up. You're welcome. You're welcome. Yeah. Go Ohio State. Yes, sir. Right. Go Bucks. <laughs> Go Bucks. That's it. That's it. <laughs> but it's good. It's yeah, good. You just kind of learned to like it. Just the first time in, man. Thanks for being with us. And remember, you can catch all of our episodes on ColumbusNeighborhoods.org. Plus, see our stories on the WOSU mobile app. And you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We'll see you back here next week on Columbus Neighborhoods. Morning time, breakfast, cooking, shake off the sleepy guy.